Welcome. My name's Maddie Harland uh, from the Permaculture Magazine YouTube channel. And today we're welcoming Liz Zorab, who's the author of Grounded and The Seasoned Gardener. So welcome, Liz. I'm so happy to see you today. Brilliant. Hello, Maddie. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, well, you're very welcome. What would be like your top tips for someone who's got a garden, but they want to grow food and they want to get into this much more connected way of gardening? And maybe they work full time and they haven't got like hours and hours to dedicate to toiling outside. They've just got a, a window of opportunity okay. to make yeah. a garden. I think one of the things that the biggest things is for us to sit down and look and be realistic with how much time and energy we have and how much space we have to use. And you can grow an awful lot of food in a, a really quite a small space and you can grow a lot of food in something that doesn't look anything like a vegetable garden, but looks like a flower garden. So you're not restricted to I must have a vegetable garden and I must have lots of time. And. And the, I think one of the key things to do is for people to, to to decide what it is that they actually eat. Because one of the key things I've learned over the last 40 years is there are loads of things I like to grow. There's masses I like to grow. That doesn't mean I want to eat them. <laughs> and... <laughs> I know that one. <laughs> and there's so things like kale. I grow loads of kale and I grow kale for, for a variety of reasons because I really like the shape. I like the form. I like how they look in the garden. I use them as ornamentals. I use them as sacrifice plants for butterflies to come and lay their eggs on and the caterpillars to eat because I still want the caterpillars in the garden, but not under my, you know, not under the nets of, of cabbages that I want to, to grow to eat. So I grow kale for loads of reasons but none of them really are for eating. And so the I think it's a really valuable thing to just to say, what is it that I want to grow and and how important it is to me? So to prioritise what it is that you want to grow, most of all, because some things are actually really good fun to grow. Potatoes are great fun, but unless you've got a big shed or a dry space that you can store all the all potatoes you've grown, you're never going to grow enough to feed a growing family for a year unless you do various different tactics about growing at different times and you're very careful about it and also that you have space. But there are other things you can grow to replace the potatoes during the winter. Things that taste almost the same, but but don't have the same storage issues. So I think if you're just starting out, decide what it is that you want to grow and then find out how to grow those things. Do you have the space? Do you have the time? Do you have the skills? And then look for alternatives, the ones that are less work and give you a higher yield and will do really well in your climate. And all that information is readily available. I offer some of it in my book, but there's, you know, there's masses on websites all you over also the do a fab thing, don't you, on your YouTube channel, which is a monthly what to sow and what to grow. Yes, absolutely. And that's really helpful as well. I mean, there's stuff in the book. There's a pay, pretty much a page every season devoted to that. But there's also stuff on the YouTube channel to, that gives even more detail and, and is about what you're doing exactly that uh, that yeah. In that year too but give us an example of um potato substitutes that are easy to grow and don't take up so much space so i never grow enough potatoes to see us through um <laughs> and so i've just gone well actually i don't really like stored potatoes very much i prefer to eat new potatoes when they've got when they are almost freshly harvested so I then grow other things that I can harvest during the winter. So things like uh, parsnips, which will sit in the ground. They're even better when they've had a frost or two. And they're really good in terms of swapping them out for a mashed potato or a roast parsnip is to me is nicer than a roast potato. There are things like uh, beans. So I grow a Greek gigantes bean, which is a type of runner bean. Uh, and you don't pick it for the green pod, you leave it on the plant till 
almost the end of the growing season and then you harvest it for the white beans in the middle and you can do this with any any runner bean and but the greek gigantes beans taste like buttery mashed potato so they're, they're there you can add them to soups to stews to other meals and and we've started making i've started making bean burgers with them and they just they're fantastic it, it, mr j came home one day and i'd made made these bean burgers and uh, did them with the tomato sauce he said those are really nice what's in them he couldn't place what it was that that you know, it was actually just it's a whole load of beans <laughs> and he was like oh so so there are beans um and then there's um you can use other root vegetables so carrots and celeriac and swede so there are all those kind of root vegetables to replace your tubers uh, your potato tubers and that works for us it wouldn't work for everyone because you know we we do eat really quite seasonally so you know if it's not available fresh uh for a lot of the year we won't have it and uh, although i do i do freeze a lot I, I do freeze a lot the nicest thing for me is to go out to the garden and harvest something that we haven't had for eight or ten months because we absolutely eat it seasonally and so the first of the purple sprouts in broccoli mm is absolutely it's just fantastic six weeks in and i'm going yeah it's more purple sprouts and broccoli won't it? <laughs> it's like a first courgette first courgette yeah all of the first first yeah. couple of meals are absolutely amazing and then once you've got a glut you're like mm, i'm gonna find other ways to to uh to eat these or to give them to the neighbors or turn them into as a type of food so giving them to chickens or ducks or pigs or something to create other foods so yeah so that that's what I try and do I try and eat the eat potatoes fresh and then we'll turn to the, the other potato substitutes or potato alternatives uh, for the rest of the winter so in terms of um, getting started on a plot of land um, I'm gonna just keep perhaps stay with this for a moment longer um what, what would be your your sort of do's but also your don'ts for for getting started it with growing for getting absolutely started i would spend a bit of time working out where the sun comes up and where it goes down uh which way the water travels across the land because you might say well it'll come downhill but it won't necessarily come straight downhill it might you might find it like some of us goes right through the middle of their vegetable garden uh, or washes through their polytunnel. Um, <laughs> uh, maybe I didn't watch long enough before I placed where things were going because I literally have, when, it, when there's heavy rain, I have a stream coming through the vegetable garden. Uh, so I want to know where the water's going, which way the wind's blowing. So where all your elements are uh, and a little bit uh, what your soil is like. Uh, is it? sandy is it heavy clay is it somewhere in between does it have lots of worms in it does it have lots of signs of of life or does it look very uh unhappily um very cloyy very dead not many worms in it so i think you and i have both had gardens where there have been very very little uh soil life going on and um and then i would say Choose the space that you're going to grow in and do one of two things. If it is late autumn, uh, you can always lay down some plastic and clear the weeds by, by laying down plastic and holding it down and blocking out the light, which will clear an area of weeds. Or you can create beds, um, and I would go for no-dig beds, whether they're raised beds or in-ground, and I would lay down um, cardboard or thick layers of paper, and and then put compost on top of it and it really doesn't need to be very much i know steph hafferty has been experimenting with just how much or how little compost you need to put on top of um on top of a sheet mulch to be able to grow in and so i would get my raised bed started um and i would also find out what i could plant is there anything i can plant at that time of year to get things growing as quickly as possible into that compost 
so that you're building up uh, root systems, you're building up all those microbial and mycelium systems going on uh, in that compost as quickly as you can. Um, because the sooner that you've got things growing in it, the better that ground's going to get. I mean, we did that when when we moved here last year. Uh, I mean, it's wonderful when you move house because you have this abundance of cardboard. Um, and we just laid as much sheet cardboard without any, obviously any tape on at all mm -hmm. on the ground. We didn't have very much compost at all. So we just... Um, had thin amounts of compost and then we just nabbed um, leaves and any organic matter. Indeed, this year I mulched a whole bed with um, shredded paper. And I know you're not meant to use bleach shredded paper, but over the cardboard, that's all I had. Um, and then I spot planted in... Um, artichoke globe artichokes and um some courgettes uh, with a lot of a lot of compost around the area that they were planted in yeah. and and it worked and and it was a particularly dark bed because um there is a very large apple tree and a rhododendron dare i say that is waiting to be um, pruned and i just didn't have time um, to prune them in the spring so they've been waiting for me to get to them and I thought well if I put down something vibrantly white it will reflect the light onto the plants and I might just even though it's incredibly shady I might just get some growth and and indeed the artichokes have established themselves the courgettes are pretty weedy and I am getting a little bit of a crop so, so I tried that and and it's better I mean it's not perfect but it's better than doing nothing and then the other thing is I had cooch I had um, creeping strawberry or convolvulus all sorts of things that you think oh you'll never get rid of those with a cardboard mulch and we did I mean I've had to Amazing. spot weed but yeah. it's nothing like having an open bed for a year and trying to keep on top of the weeding. What I'd be really interested to know is if people have had to deal with things like cooch grass and uh, Bermuda grass and all those other, they've got different names all over the, yes, over, they over do. the world. So to know whether they've managed to, to actually eliminate them using cardboard and compost, that would be great to hear people's it success would. stories. I mean, I'm still lifting out long white roots of cooch grass, um, which is a particularly vigorous perennial gra grass in our climate. Yeah. Um, but, but it's it's not clods of it. It's not it's not overwhelming. It's it's doable and it doesn't disturb the crops around it because I'm catching it soon enough. So you know, this m practical mulching to me uh, and raised bed systems just the absolute what to do isn't it yeah you know it makes it makes gardening possible for me i guess i know there is a lot of conversation about whether you have raised raised beds or yeah, yeah. in the ground raised beds and i really don't think it makes a huge amount of difference uh, if you have wooden sides to your bed or you've got stone sides yeah you've got places for slugs to hide um if you are working with in ground, uh, you've got just as many voles to deal with, or maybe even more moles. I think I think there are advantages and disadvantages to each method, um, and I like them both. So I <laughs> yes, I mean we inherited raised beds with wooden sides here that were very overgrown, um, and grass paths. And in an ideal world, I wouldn't have a grass path because inevitably the grass grows through into the veggie bed I mean but you've got a system haven't you that's that's really easy to manage T tell us a little bit about your wood chip paths and what you do once so, so yes yeah, so I have wood chip pathways and uh, as I'm deadheading plants or I'm uh, lifting up annual weeds I'll just drop them onto the path uh, and then the ducks wander through and you know are allowed access to the garden in the winter and the weather and uh, all of those other things work on the wood chips and quietly turn them into very nice organic material 
And after a couple of years, it usually only takes sort of about 18 months to two years, I scoop it up and I put it into the beds and lay down fresh wood chips. So I'm basically composting all around the beds and then just moving that stuff into the beds. And that's just, instead of lugging stuff for miles and compost is heavy, um, yep. you're, you're making it on the spot on your paths. Yes. So, I mean, that's another great example of of low energy techniques in the garden. Yes, I, I have. I fail to see the point in in taking small bits of greenery and taking them over to the compost heap. If I'm if I'm clearing huge great swathes or I'm cutting a tree back, sure, I'll take those over to the compost heap rather than having a huge pile <laughs> on the path I'm going to fall over. But all my deadheading uh, goes into the pathway. Yes, those seeds often germinate, and then brilliant, I can go through the pathway pick up all those little plants, plant them somewhere else or ah. give them to other people, you know, so ah. they're not wasted. <laughs> so thank you very much, everyone, for listening to this um, conversation. And um, if you've enjoyed it, please do like our channel. And we'd love it if you subscribed as well. So that's enough for today. But thanks very much, Liz, for being here. Bye.